if I was to lie down tomorrow and die, I have hope that there is enough within the young people that we will still be here in 100 and 200 words. Years. In 100 or 200 years. <laughs> you ridiculous. <laughs> My name is Kona. I identify as a black femme lifestyle leather dyke. I'm the first person in several generations on both sides of my family to be born outside of Guyana, South America. Uh, my people that I uh, uh, then originate back to uh, are the Wapinashu people of South America in Guyana. Uh, but then also my people were heavily slaved originally from Africa to the, the Caribbean. I've struggled for a lot of years around what my relationship as a black person on unceded territory is. Because I regard myself as a stolen person on stolen land. It's a very fraught place for me to be. Um, and as a seed that's been planted here in this place and who is considered a weed, something to be controlled, someone, a person whose value shows up in a commercial context or an appropriation context. My grandmother, she, was she had always wanted me to have long hair. There's a lot of stuff around black people and hair that is super complicated. She always wanted me to have long flowing hair. I made the choice to be natural. This did not make her happy. And she said, but it looks good on you. And she said, I bet these white people, they want your hair. They like your hair, don't they? And I said, yes, they do. People comment on my hair all the time, grandma. And she said, these white people, they want the culture, but they don't want the challenge. That lately what I've been saying is, for queers who don't get the idea of appropriation, think about what it is to have corporations in pride. Think about what it is to have chip makers and candy makers put rainbows during pride season on their products so that they can sell more products. Like, make no mistake, it's not that they're here for us, it's that it's about money. And often queer people are upset about corporations appropriating and leveraging queerness for their own dollars and that is the access point of appropriation. As a black person um, within queer culture there is so much appropriation. Um, African-American vernacular, uh, what's a classic example? The use of the word yes which is an appropriation and when it comes out of the mouths of black people, there is an aspect of ghettoization that occurs, and when it comes out of the mouths of white queers, it's cool. When I go to Pride, I'm really conscious of being an animal in the zoo. I feel like what's happened is that a bunch of people who are not us come and look at us and stare at us and participate with us and yes, there's a piece that's about solidarity, but there's also a huge piece that's just about an event. It's about a party. And there, we are the animals in the zoo. And when we dress up and try to be our authentic selves, that is seen as something that's picture worthy. And it's evidence of how we are a spectacle, but not a people. And I have to say, the young people that I'm encountering these days are brilliant, brilliant. And a five-year-old was going around the party asking people if they were gender neutral. Why? Because they had been talking about pronouns, gender neutrality, being non-binary. They were talking about it in kindergarten. And this young child was going around a party of adults asking them if they were gender neutral and really trying to understand how the people that were in that child's circle what the word meant in relation to those people. And I think to myself, there is so much hope in that. If it's in five-year-olds, and those five-year-olds are 10, when they're 15, when they're 20, when they're voting age, that's already in their DNA.
there's so many stories I could tell. I have so many current critiques I could say. And really what I have is joy in this day and in this process and laughter. I have a lot of hope. Do I look good? You look good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>